Hey there, I'm Scott, and this is Tangents. Well, we're almost two weeks into 2022, and this is my first episode since the 31st. I uh, don't think, well, as I'm recording this, you certainly have not heard that or seen it because I haven't had a chance to put it up yet. Uh, it's one of these things, I, I talk about this a lot, but you would think that just taking some audio, taking some video, um, recording it, extemporaneously speaking, putting it on fucking you know podcast and YouTube, wouldn't be a big deal. And I'm not certainly compared to people who actually do a lot of production value in their stuff. I'm not putting a ton of effort into this, but still, I mean, even even when I have time to record them, the time that it takes to do that minimal amount of editing that I do just prepping it and putting it up is pretty significant. And uh, I'm not complaining or anything. I'm just saying, you know, it's kind of annoying because I would love, I don't know, I would really love to be in a position where I could just do one of these a week and uh, not have, I don't know. I mean, most of the stuff that I'm working on, I don't feel like is really, I don't know. I, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I don't, I don't feel like it's really that worth worthy of my time or talents. And I don't, I don't think it's like even me being arrogant. I think this is kind of, kind of the state for most people in most of what they do. Uh, it's just dumb and a waste of time. And frankly, um, if you stopped doing it, the world would not fall off of its axis. You know, most of us are not collecting garbage or doing some other essential task where if you didn't do it, uh, things would start piling up badly. And, uh, you know, most of us, you, you could probably just fuck off for, you know, go to work, kind of let the foot off the gas pedal, let things kind of slide. And it'd be a while, honestly, before something happened. It's, um, it's kind of sad. I think, I, I really think, I mean, I talk to people about UBI and uh, I get in arguments with people a lot about, you know, like, well, I, I, I think, I believe, I really do think if you're alive and certainly if you're in a, a, a nation as wealthy as ours, you should basically be able to not necessarily live like extravagantly, not, you know, have like crazy luxury items, but you should be able to subsist. And by subsist, I mean, eat decently well, you know, again, you're not going out and getting like $200 meals, but you know, you're not eating just like um, ramen all the time. You could be eating something that's decent, healthy, tastes good enough. Um, you should have more than just minimal shelter. You should be able to have, you know, not necessarily like a mansion, but a little bit of nice housing or housing, a uh, little space of your own and Healthcare should just be there. If you want to do, um, if you want to go to college, you want to go to graduate school, you should be able to do that and uh, not have a job per se. And I get a lot of pushback on that. People are like, oh, well, if you do that, then people will just fuck off and play video games all day, Scott. And first off, I don't think that that necessarily is a bad thing. I mean, in fact, I've talked about this before, but Twitch is a profession for a lot of people. A lot of people play video games and just talk and they make shit tons of money. Yeah. So I'm not sure that deriding people for playing video games is necessarily that real, but also, I mean, I, I, people have almost an inherent need to feel like we're doing something of value. And I've gotten in arguments with Gil about this, but uh, well, not really arguments, but slight dispute. Yeah, he kind of is on the the leaning of, you know, like, well, people like to, not like to, I guess I shouldn't say that, but people, to some extent in his mind, need um, to be pushed back a little bit to push the other way. Yeah, so, like, uh, he's saying if Einstein lived in a utopia, maybe he wouldn't have done the things that he did. And I, I tend to think, you know, especially someone like Einstein, that, I, I think Einstein is going to do what he's going to do to some extent. And 
if you remove a lot of the obstacles for him, he'd probably do more. You know, if he didn't have to be a patent clerk, um, I don't know, maybe it helped him along his journey, but I kind of suspect that he would just have done more stuff. He probably would have had more of a chance to do more interesting stuff. And maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. I know for myself too, like I, if I, if I wasn't doing the stuff that I have to do to make money, um, not that I have to do the specific stuff that I'm doing. I mean, I, I have other options, but whatever I'm doing, I have some set of shit that I have to do to make money and to survive. Um, if I wasn't doing that, I would still be doing a ton of other stuff. I would, you know, I mean, the main reason I stopped, like it, it if money wasn't an object, and especially if like I could just kind of take whatever path I wanted, I would probably just be collecting degrees. And you know, if I, if I was gonna live indefinitely and I didn't have to worry about a lot of other stuff, I'd be getting PhDs, you know, uh, in a bunch of different subjects. I'd probably get an MD, I'd get a JD, um, and it, maybe even practice those for a little bit. And, and certainly like, you know, if life wasn't so fucking short, then I would definitely do that. I mean, it's like a, a complete no-brainer to me. And I don't think that's a waste of time or effort or anything, resources, whatever. And I would also be doing research probably and developing stuff and working on stuff and building stuff that probably would be a fuck ton cooler than any of the shit that I'm doing now. And when I say cooler, I mean not only you know, just cooler on a kind of abstract level, but probably more useful, less just fucking stupid. I mean, some of the stuff that I'm doing now, I'm not gonna say it's like actively pushing the ball backwards, but there are products that I'm working on that I'm just like, I, I just don't believe in, you know, to say the, to put it mildly. And uh, it's, it's a problem, right? Because you, to some extent, kind of trade your, your labor and your talents for money. And the problem is that the people that have the money to do that stuff, at least maybe, maybe other people are better at finding them than I am and the people that I have doing this for me, but the, the people that seem to have the money don't have great ideas and they don't have, um, yeah, they're just not a ton of insight, not a ton of, you know, whatever it is, I don't know. But that's frustrating. Um, so I, I, I do believe with almost complete certainty, I would be doing better, more interesting, more valuable stuff. Stuff that would probably push the ball forward for, you know, and I'm not saying like I personally would make a massive contribution to the human race, but I'd make a bigger contribution certainly than I am or than I have been um, without a doubt. And uh, it would be stuff that, you know, other people would build on and it would end up being in accumulation a big deal when you start having a ton of people doing shit like that. And certainly I think like, you know, if even if you want to start a business or something like this, like the, the problems of like you want to build this thing and that's, that's cool, but to get there, you have to do all this other shit and you know, all of that other shit. If you're not independently wealthy and you don't have a lot of resources, somehow you have to make money because you can't just, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't just fuck around and tinker with shit. Uh, you kind of have to live someplace, you know, you, and you can live modestly, but even if you do, the current world as it's structured, it, it's not really conducive to that. Now, maybe you're lucky and you have a relative who can help you or you have a a rich friend benefactor, but yeah, I don't think you're going to get that far. Um, and I got to tell you also, I mean, you know, there's slight tangent here, but um, yesterday I was in a call with somebody who, uh, I, don't, I don't know how much, this is one of these things. I was like, how much should I share in terms of this stuff? Um, gonna try to speak in abstracts. Uh, if the person who I'm gonna talk about is listening or watching, then they might know who they are, but hopefully I'm not gonna give you enough information to piece it together, unless you have a lot of, unless you have already almost all of the pieces anyway, which you probably won't. Uh, so yesterday, I'm talking with somebody, and 
He's an investor in one of the projects that I've that I've worked on for a while. And it's a project that you know we've we've ground away for a long time. It's not moved as fast by any means as I would like. Uh, but we're getting to the point where we can actually like start selling something. And we have some initial customers kind of teed up and we have um, I think we're actually getting to a point where there will be something interesting coming, at least in this one project, soonish. So this guy is working on his own thing, and one of the aspects of his own thing is that he wants to kind of uh, not just do the stuff that he was doing, but sort of take a real leadership role in startups and kind of be not exactly like an accelerator, but kind of like, um, in their words, a partner. Um, I would put a big asterisk on that partner, but uh, yeah, partner. And by partner here, they mean that for essentially an in-kind investment, so you know, no capital in, uh, they wanna take a 50% ownership stake of a company. And now I will say this, there's, there's obviously, it's better to own a small piece of something than all of nothing, right? So if you're starting a company and you had this deal and it was really pretty guaranteed to work, or you were starting a company and on your own, you're just not going to make it work and somebody wants to take half of it, but they'll actually turn it into something. Maybe that's a deal that's not bad. If you've been working on something for like half a decade and somebody comes to you and they're like, well, you know, I'm gonna do some stuff for you um, and basically take over the company in a lot of ways. Um, and I'm going to take half the ownership stake and I'm not gonna put any money in the company to get stuff done. And you've put in crazy amounts of time and effort and hours um, and thought and sweat and pain and all of this stuff. Not the, not the most favorable you know, I mean, it was one of these things, honestly, like it was, um, I, I just, I could not believe that this person was making this offer. You know, it was, I, I, I just like, we, we've made dumb mistakes in terms of fundraising. And, you know, we've, we had an advisor once who, um, in one of my companies, and this was early on before I did, you know, I was just, I was kind of naive and maybe kind of dumb, but. Uh, we give him, luckily, with vesting, we give him a 5% ownership stake um, to be an advisor. No money in, no real advice, no value um, of anything. I mean, he did set us up with a couple meetings with some, eh, not quite top tier, but medium tier VCs. Nothing ever came of any of that. If, if that would have materialized into a shit ton of money, then maybe we'd be in a different position here. But nothing really came from his contribution. Luckily, we stopped his vesting at something like, uh, I don't know, less than 1%. I don't remember what it was, but I know it was less than 1%, which still is obscenely too much for his contribution in this, uh, if you could even call it a contribution. But, you know, that was, and that was a fucked up stupid thing that we did. That's 5% of a company that, uh, you know, ended up just, stopping at 1% and it was not really like giving up the company uh, and all of this kind of stuff. This guy is basically saying, I'm going to give you no cash um, and I'm, I'm going to subcon out all of the stuff. And actually we were going to raise a fund and we're going to use the money in that fund to essentially like hire out external contractors to do the development for your thing. And it's just like the deal it's one of these things where you know you present it on its face and it's bad, but then every time you kind of like paint a new, you know, you, you, you threw the first layer of paint on the can the canvas and it looks terrible. And then you keep adding these brush strokes here and there. You got the putty knife out and you're scraping it and doing all this. Every fucking stroke that you're putting on there, it looks worse. It's just like a warm, steaming, like, greasy pile of just explosive diarrhea spraying out and you know like some chunks in there and some corn and just all kinds of stuff like landing on the canvas and as however disgusting however horrible you think it is 
the next the next pass it's even worse the next pass it's even worse still and you're just sitting there like it is this really happening like i mean if this guy wasn't an investor and he didn't have a bit of a relationship with uh, my business partner i would have told him like I mean, honestly, I would have just told him to go fuck off. Are you insane? Like, no, we're not going to do this deal. I did, for me, I got as strong with that as I uh, was likely to get under those circumstances, which is pretty measured, but, you know, clear. Uh, but, yeah, it's just like, uh, I, I just could not believe that this was a thing that somebody was presenting to me. Yeah. Now, and especially also like the thing that he wants to do is take over like the high level design and conceptual sort of stuff. Um, I'm fine there. You know, my, my limitation is and has always been like, I, I'm a very good engineer. I'm very capable, but I'm one person. I have very limited bandwidth and I have to do other shit to make money. And, you know, and so it's like, I've done a lot myself on this and I have people now helping me a little bit. Um, as their time permits, but it's just like, you know, I need, I need money to hire people. I don't need, uh, somebody else to sit there and start pushing things around and making decisions that I'm not going to agree with. And the thing also that irritates me about this is like, this is a project I've worked on for a long time. I have a lot of pretty strong opinions on it and I think I'm right, but, and, and I could understand, okay, you're like, okay, maybe I, I don't think you're right, Scott. Maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe I'm right. I don't know, but I've never conducted the experiment. There's no, like, it hasn't been tried and failed. It's just like right now, the thing is just kind of like lingering out there, partially complete, slowly coalescing into something. And like, I, I have, there's no way in hell that I would give up after, especially after putting so much fucking time and effort into this, there's no way I'm going to get like this close to the finish line and say, okay, you take it over, put your own stink on it, uh, do your own thing. And then I'm not, was what I was going to try work going to work, which, and, and what I was going to try is very different than the direction that this guy is going. I mean, it was a kind of weird combination because it was like, part of it is like, you'd get the layers of things that he wants to do and just absolutely know, like they're totally they're not congruent with the thing that I want to build. Um, and I understand why he wants to do them because they're the kind of things that people do, but I want to try something different. I mean, that's the whole fucking point of why I'm doing this thing, this, this one project. And then the other thing was like, they're throwing out like, well, you should do this and this and this and this. And it's like, yeah, I know. I mean, yeah, there, there was no, con it's not even like a conceptual contribution there. It's like, oh, you should do these things. Well, of course, that's the fucking shit I want to do. That was the, you know, I mean, in fact, some of the stuff that they're like presenting, like it's, oh, it's, you know, allow us to peel back the, uh, the veneer on our, um, our beautiful, just gilded, um, yeah. You know, no, the things that they're sit sitting there suggesting are things that I'm like, yeah, that's the fucking shit that I'm trying to get to. And I would already be there if I had the fucking resources. The one thing that I feel, and I, I told this to one of my employees who was in this call, but um, they're, they're pretty young and haven't had a lot of exposure to that part of the, you know, the fundraising and um, meetings and deals and all this kind of stuff. And not that I'm an expert on this, but I mean, I, we're, we're just sitting there talking and it was like, um, I don't know, if somebody is offering something material, you know, like something that's actually going to get you to the next thing. That's good. But if you're going to take an investment and the, the mistake, other than those, like, like a couple of people who were advisors on projects and got way too much, I even like a couple of advisors have gotten like a quarter of a percent or a half a percent of a company. And to me, for what they put in way too much. Yeah. If you get, if you had like, um, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Kosala, but Imagine you get Vinod, right? And he wants to be an advisor and he's going to take a quarter of a percent. He's probably, you know, just by the virtue of having somebody like that on your board or on your company or as an advisor, you're probably going to take, you know, like a massive amount of investment. 
uh, pretty quickly. And yeah, if you have that, then okay, maybe it's worth it. But if you are bringing in somebody who's not gonna bring anything to the table, they're gonna bring bad ideas or ideas that you've already had or ideas that are just so fucking obvious that anyone could see them and they're gonna take a massive chunk of the company and not put any kind of resources in, not a good fucking thing. And so the other, the other kind of investment mistake that I've made is taking, and this is one that sounds kind of weird because it, it's like, it's actually two pieces. One is taking not nearly enough money and the other is giving up way too much equity for that amount of money. And the, the reason this is a problem, and it's actually really a fucking annoying thing with this kind of stuff, because if, you, if you're Elizabeth Holmes and uh, you know, you're, you're in kind of plugged in to VCs and you can get people to just throw money at you and write, che write big checks, it's different. But if you're a normal person and you're not like a, um, a pathological liar, essentially, who can just, uh, you know, you're not Travis K from Uber and just sitting there or um, what's his name? Adam, whatever the fuck from uh, WeWork. Or you're, you're not just a con person. You're not an Elizabeth Holmes. If you're like a normal person and you don't have those kinds of connections, raising a lot of money on a good valuation is really hard. And the... Part of the problem there is the investors, especially if you're getting money from people who are not like professional investors, they, they want, they're putting in money, it feels like a lot of money to them, so they want to take a big chunk of the company, which sounds you know fair, I guess. If I was putting in a lot of money for me, whatever a lot of money is for somebody, like you know, if, if $1,000 is a lot of money to you, then you'd probably feel like you wanted a lot of the company. If $100,000 is a lot to you, you probably feel like you want a lot of the company for it. But if you do that, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because I mean, two things, one, in order to do stuff and especially the kind of stuff that I'm trying to do, it takes, and, and I've been, I've been insanely capital efficient. Uh, like, and part of this is just not to toot my own horn too much, but I can do like the firmware and the software and the cloud stuff and the electrical engineering and the mechanical engineering. And blah, blah, blah. I can do a lot of this stuff. I have done it and have gotten things pretty fucking far, like to, to an extent that, and again, not to blow myself too much here, but you know, like contort down on you. But I've gotten some stuff to the point where other companies would spend probably into the millions of dollars and be about the same place, maybe a little bit further behind. Um, you know, so, and I've done that for a very small amount of money, relatively speaking. But the problem is, you know, again, one person, you know, I mean, you get burnt out and you also just like, if I had no other, like, I didn't need to, to find money to pay for shelter or student loans or any of this other stuff. And I could just work on it. And I had the money to get like board revisions and prototypes and all this kind of stuff built. Maybe, maybe I could do it. But absent that stuff, and having to essentially work on other stuff at the same time, I just can't fucking do it. And, or but I can, but it's like painfully, excruciatingly slow. Um, and again, now I have some help there, but it's still like, you know, just painful. Um, so giving up too much for too little and not taking enough capital, because if you don't have enough capital, it, and again, both of these actually like the investor thinks that they're helping themselves. But if you take too big of a stake, then you can't raise more money later on because people look at the cap table and they're like, well, why does this person who put in this little tiny amount have 20% of the company? And then they're like, well, if it be two things, I, I keep forking off two, two, two. But anyway, one of the things is going to be, um, I want a similar valuation, which means you're selling the whole company for nothing. And the other is, you know, like the cap table is kind of fucked. And uh, even if I give it a bigger valuation, this person's got way oversized portion and you have way too little to give. So either you're going to end up with a very tiny fraction of, of equity or, you know, we're going to have to reset the cap table by issuing shares or doing something to, you know, and, and often also like naive investors, probably because they've watched the social network and seen, um, 
Shark Tank or whatever, but they'll, they'll do things like put in uh, non-dilute clauses, which is yet again one of these things that sounds like a really great plan, but if you put in non-dilute cla clauses or things like that that really mu they're, they're non-standard and they kind of muck with the, um, the capitalization of the company, it really makes new money coming in much harder. Now, I'm sure if you're making fuck tons of money and you've got a goose that lays golden eggs and it's like obviously people are just trying, like bending over to try to throw money at you because they want to get in on that, I'm sure they'll overlook that stuff. But if you're kind of like an okay company and there's, you know, there the investors are kind of looking for reasons to say no and they see stuff like that and they're like, okay, um, yeah, I'm good. Anyway, rolling back. Uh, not taking on enough capital, giving up too much equity, um, they'll, they'll, they'll screw you over. And it's it's almost to an extent where I would say, like, if you can't, if you can't take enough money to get the stuff done or to get to the next step, you probably shouldn't take any money. If you, if you need 500 grand and someone's willing to write a check for 80, or say you need a couple million and someone's willing to write a check for 80, K, um, you probably, you know, looking back in retrospect, it's probably actually better not even to take that because that's not going to get you very far. You know, you, you'll boil that off really fucking quickly. And then you still have the capital need that you had before, but now you've taken on money and you have kind of a responsibility to that investor. Um, you know, it's just better to take more. Um, now, of course, how the fuck do you do that? I don't fucking know. I, all I know is I listened to um, the Slate Political Gab Fest and David Plotz is on there talking about how much there's all this money out there and it's just looking for things to to invest in. And, you know, they're just, if you go out to investors, there's just so much easy money. I mean, like, you hear stuff like this and you've been struggling for a long time and it just makes you want to fucking kill somebody. I mean, like, I obviously, I'm a very, relatively speaking, zen kind of not angry person but it's just like what the fuck what the fuck uh you hear that stuff and it's just it, it's it's infuriating as far as i get you know as close as i get too angry i would get at that and it's really more just annoyed and frustrated and like what the, why 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 you know anyway the thing that um i i over the intervening time between the last one of these I recorded and this one, I kind of have ebbs and flows of what I want to talk about. And I've had different names come up for the word. And the thing that I think I want to call this one, actually, weirdly enough, is sides. And I, the reason for this is manifold. Everything for me is, it's never like a simple, straightforward X because of Y. Um, Gil asked me yesterday or the day before about the, um, the Steve Jobs movie, uh, with the reference to Joni Mitchell. And I, I do remember when I was talking about that, I think I, I don't know if I said, um, the wrong name or what, it, I think it was clear, but uh, in my mind, I said the wrong name. I couldn't think of Joni Mitchell and I couldn't think of both sides was the song. Um. I probably said the right thing, and then it's just like all in my head that uh, that I fucked it up, but that's how I think. Anyway, though, he was asking me about that and uh, wanted to know what that movie was. And I, I don't remember the name. I think it's Jobs. I'm not sure. Which, whichever one it is, it's the one with uh, Seth Rogen, who was playing Waz, and uh, the sort of three presentations, and then they kind of weave in... Um, uh, what is her name? It's gonna Lisa. They name, they weave in his daughter Lisa, and she's kind of there in the background, and they have uh, his uh, his wife, and you know, like eh, stuff is kind of, and you kind of see this stuff, and then the daughter is talking to him, and brings up the the Joni Mitchell song, and the two versions of it. Now, in reality, there are many more versions of it, and I've listened to several of them. But it was an interesting thing. It, it's a. This is one of those things I think, like the layers of, uh, like in my flight training, I'm learning the same stuff over and over again. 
to some extent, but it's like algebra or calculus. Every time you learn it, you get a new, you get new insights, you get new kind of like understanding of it. You get better at it. And it's not just like you're getting marginally better. It's like, oh, new things come on that you didn't, you didn't even, I didn't even realize this before. And then you start going like, oh, that's why the chain rule works that way. Or, oh, this is why the fractional dimensional integration does this thing. Or, you know, um, the big integration does that thing. Or what, you know, an abstract set of measures zero does. And all of this kind of stuff. You start getting pieces that come into focus. And it's not just, I mean, there are certainly things where you're like slowly getting marginally better. Uh, you know, like landings. Landings to a large extent. Once you've kind of got the, the site picture down, you get the uh, you get most of the stuff done. There's a lot of just dialing in, right? You're doing the same things. Ideally, you you get into a nice stabilized approach. Uh, you get the aiming point. You kind of got your configuration there. You got the power in right. You know the what the wind is doing. You come in, and you just keep getting a little bit better at that. But Every once in a while, there'll be something like, oh, I'm in a crosswind landing. And if I, if I uh, put the rudder this way and the ailerons that way, um, then I can actually like translate myself while facing the runway without, you know, kind of coming in, crabbing. You can actually like line up with the runway and touch down with the, uh, the nose wheel in a nice configuration. So you're not side loading the the landing gear. Uh, it, you, you know, figure that out and you're like, oh, that makes sense. Um, the one that I've been recently kind of having come online is just uh, in the in both the Cirrus and the Cessnas uh, that I'm learning. The, uh, the Cirrus I kind of fly on my own just sort of for fun when I can, although it's fucking stupidly expensive. Uh, the Cessna, not that I have a lot of money to do it, so I'm doing it very infrequently. The Cessna, much, much cheaper. And that one I do my IFR training with, my instructor in. Um, but that one, uh, it, it, both of them have something akin to a G1000. So Garmin makes, the, the avionics package is like underneath and in, in something. And then it has the displays and those have like the GPS and all this stuff. And the G1000 is one of the series of this and then the Cirrus has it's called Cirrus Perspective, which is basically a skinned version of the G1000. They're a little bit different, but pretty similar. Um, it's it's not an intuitive interface, and the thing that they do is it's not a bad interface to be honest. Uh, like especially you can kind of see how it evolved, and they started out with these little display things and like nothing in them, so. You couldn't probably do a touch screen and you couldn't do all these other things you might like. So they have this big knob, little knob, and the little knob is a button. You can turn the little knob, you can turn the big knob. And the big knob takes you, depending on where you are, it's very context dependent, but it, like it will take you to different screens or different menus. And then the little knob will take you to kind of dial in certain things and then you can press it to toggle it. And there's a lot of just getting comfortable with that. And that is, it's not natural to me quite yet, but it's, I, I can feel like I'm on the cusp of just being able to reach over and like click, 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 and I've got it done. Um, not there, but I'm, it's definitely like coming into focus. And it's been, especially for somebody who's usually really good with computers and software and interfaces and this kind of stuff, it's been painfully slow for me. Uh, just to figure that out. I mean, part of it is also like, it's not just that you have to figure it out, but when you're doing it, you're not on the ground, like, oh, experimenting with it. You're in the air and you have to, you have to load the procedure or you have to, um, you know, get in a, figure out a holding pattern or figure out your pattern entry or do, do X or Y or Z. And you're flying and, you know, you're getting close to whatever and you're communicating and you're just doing all these things at the same time. And it's a lot while you're learning, especially. It's, it's like I can feel I'm on the cusp of hitting that. Uh, so similarly, the, um, 
the Joni Mitchell song, I, I had heard that song. For, I, I remember when I was a kid hearing it. Yeah, you know? uh, I remember a movie referencing it and saying like clowns instead of clouds. In fact, when I was a kid, I think I heard clowns instead of clouds illusions. Um, and you know, you you get the same song, but you hear it over and over again. And I kind of had an appreciation for it. Yeah, I don't think like I'm, it's not my favorite song, but I do like it. And then I watched that movie, and it just, I never noticed this thing where, like, the younger version of hers has a different thing. And in fact, there's an older, st the, the movie reference is a younger one and an older one, and then there's even more recent than the older one. And it's kind of weird, the trajectory, because in the, the younger one, if you listen to, like, the contents of the song, what the lyrics are saying, it's pretty depressing. But there's kind of an upbeat thing to it. This is what uh, Lisa, the, the, the actor playing Lisa, is telling Steve and the audience. But, you know, the, the younger one was kind of more optimistic. So even though the content of the song was a certain thing, it was a lighter, kind of happier sort of sound. And then when she's older, it sounds like, you know, you kind of have gone through the ringer. Your life has kind of fucked you over a little bit. Uh, you know, you, you've you done the sort of uh, really attractive woman in Hollywood and been taken advantage of, and, you know, you've gone through a certain path of life that jades you a little bit. And you can hear that in her voice, I think, and in the performance of the song. And then in the later ones still, I'm not saying it's, like, happy again, but it's more, um, how would you say, like, resolved in a sense. It's like, you've kind of, yeah, I've gone through a lot of shit. Uh, I was very jaded. And now I kind of have some perspective on that. And even though I remember, like, a lot of things were fucked up and a lot of things, I'm still kind of like, I don't want to say like, okay with it. But you know, you're kind of in a place where you're a little bit more detached from it. And you just kind of have some perspective that you didn't have earlier on. Um, or at least that's how I, maybe I'm like completely reading this in and it's not real, but that's how I see it. And it's interesting to me just how much stuff like that, like, go, uh, you know, just in life. I mean, Gil was saying this as well. That there's so much in life where, especially things when you actually develop real expertise in something, you go over the same stuff. Like in, in high school biology, um, we went over genetics. And I, I think we did Mendel's stuff, which turns out is not exactly real, but it's, you know, real enough that it kind of gives you like the broad strokes of some stuff. But we also did a little tiny bit of like, what is DNA? What is RNA? What is transcription and translation? Uh, what is replication and all of this stuff? And then in college, I took uh, bio 181 and 182. And in 181, went over the same stuff. I took uh, microbiology 220. Um, along with 206, the lab that I later taught. Um, and that one, man, that lab TA was one of my earlier, earlier crushes. That was, uh, yeah. anyway, it's just kind of funny. That was, uh, it, it's weird how much you like, I don't know. You go through this path and then you think about stuff and you think about stuff that you hadn't thought about in a while. Um, and, you know, she was uh, very nice and attractive and a little bit older, probably, uh, I think probably was dating somebody or, you know, obviously would have been very inappropriate to, to ask. And I also was probably too young and I was definitely um, nowhere near in a position where could date someone like, uh, you know, I mean, I guess I could have, but it's like people do it, but I was just not together in that sense. I, I had a lot of growing to do. I had a lot of, you know, but anyway, I don't know why that's, uh, that was Mike 206. And then Mike 220 went over the genetics again. And every time you're doing it, you're learning a little bit more. And even if you're doing the same stuff again and again, you're learning just a little bit more and a little you know, extra details and then more things about like, what is a transposon or what is a primer or what is all of this kind of stuff. And 
And then we went over, like I took it in genetics and I took it in um, molecular biology and virology and virology in grad school and, you know, a bunch of grad level, um, you know, immunology and infectious disease microbiology and a bunch of other classes. And also, I guess, in, um, wow, it's amazing how many times I've gone over that stuff, actually. But you do that stuff and every time you do, you know, you still are learning more stuff about it. It's, it's one of these things like you, it's part of, I think, why Dunning-Kruger is so insidious because once you've gone through all of that stuff, once you're like Joni Mitchell in the later years, you have a very different perspective on stuff than you, you know, like it, it's interesting because like she had kind of like the broad strokes of insights in terms of certain aspects of life in the lyrics of the song, like the, the song when she was younger said certain things. And then it was kind of like she grew into really embodying the song to some extent. And obviously I'm like, uh, this is a complete person with a hundred thousand little other things. This is like one little thread, but in this thread of the song, it's kind of like she grew into the song and then kind of grew past it in a way. And as you're learning something and becoming an expert on it, first you you learn about it and you're like, oh, well, this is, I, of course, I understand totally exactly what this is. I, I don't think that I'm that arrogant. I like the, the thing, but I, it's a very common human trait, right? You just kind of learn a little bit and you're like, ah, I got it. And then you go over it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And, again. and then eventually you kind of understand it in a, you know, it is the same stuff, but you understand it in such a deeper level than you did previously. And it's just not even, it's not comparable. And when you get like out here, you realize how little you understood. And you also more than that realize how, even though you understand so much more than you did before, you realize, oh, I understand the tiniest little pinprick of this stuff. And there's a, you know, any one of these aspects, there are entire PhDs, there are entire departments their entire careers based on like one aspect of like, how does tRNA work? You know, just one little, what is, what is uh, this thing? What is, how does this tiny element of like uh, getting, you know, protein expression to happen or gene expression? How does this one, this other thing, you know, all of that stuff has so much to it. And yet here, you have such a big knowledge compared to earlier on. Now, and in fact, I would say at this point, you kind of are like pretty much, you know, I'm not saying you know nothing, but it's hopefully getting a little bit more toward the Aristotle thing where you're like, yeah, I, I have a decent understanding, but there's a lot that you don't know. And of course, Twitter is like the land of Dunning-Kruger where you, know, you have people that know fucking fuck all about a lot of things. And I, I say Twitter, but I mean, you know, like a lot of things in life. I think it's really, I don't know if it, like maybe it was always there and I just didn't know about it, but I see so much of it now and I find it very painful and frustrating. Uh, I just saw somebody, I mean, oh, and here's another, another meaning of sides here because I guess sides also, I remember, I think it was Quantum Leap. I'm not sure, uh, but something that I watched when I was younger, someone was talking about sides. I think it was Al in Quantum Leap and it was the pages, the, um, the like if you're in a play, your lines, essentially your sides. Uh, it'd be funny if that was something completely different, but it, it, it's vaguely like in there. Um, that was another sides, but that doesn't have anything to do with the sides here just kind of a weird tangent of a tangent of a tangent. The other sides thing though is I, I was I was on Twitter. It, again, always happens. Um, although who, who knows? It's, there are a lot of things I like about it, but there are also a lot of things I don't. Um, anyway though, I was on Twitter and this woman is sitting there talking. First off, she had a poll and it was like, um, should Twitter let t Trump back in? And I of course voted Fuck no. And the first thing you notice is when you get, when you vote, you see the results and it's like a lot of people are saying yes. In fact, more people said that they should 
than not. And the weird thing is she's kind of followed by a lot of leftists. So you would think, no, but apparently. Not. And then you go down through the replies and she's explaining that, you know, like, well, the, those libs, they don't have the establishment, aren't afraid, aren't afraid of us, but they're afraid of him. Which, which honestly, I mean, it's just, I, I don't know how anyone would fucking, I, I get like people, the nature of being human is to some extent just being really dumb and not really aware of how dumb we are. I think that's, you know, it's depressing, but it's like a lot of it. And I understand like Hillary had the whole Pied Piper strategy where it's like, oh, well, we definitely want to run against Trump because he can't possibly win. So if we get him up there and we build him up, then we'll be able to run against him. We'll be able to beat him. And then, aha, yeah, that worked out really fucking well. Um, and in, to me, just even at the time seemed dumb as fuck. But yeah. Now you, you have this woman on Twitter who's sitting there who's a lawyer and a PD, a public defender, in fact. So it's not like, you know, there's some random kid. It's like somebody who actually has a career and should have some fucking better judgment, you would think. But they're, she's going like, you know, like they're afraid of him. And the thing is, they're not afraid of him. In fact, you could see like Nancy Pelosi had to be dragged kicking and screaming to impeach the guy. Uh, she, when she finally did it, when she finally did it, it was basically like, she had no choice. And even then, even when she had no choice, she limited the scope. It was so late anyway. It was like, I don't know, once you accept things as reality, once things are a certain way for a while, that's kind of how they are. If you would have done it earlier on, um, it might've actually mattered a little bit. And if the scope wasn't so limited, so you could kind of go back and say, these are all of the things. Cause like when he was president, literally every fucking week, there would be some massive, horrible thing that by itself, by itself, was like the biggest scandal of any previous administration. Every week. And then the next week, there'd be another one. And you'd forget about the previous one because it was just this endless succession of that shit. One of the things that would have been nice to do when you're doing the fucking impeachment would be like review those things because... I, I knew about a lot of these things and I would I'd look back and I'd be like, oh shit, I completely forgot about that because there's so much shit. It, it's, I mean, it's, I don't know that it's necessarily an, intrin an intentional strategy, but um, his whole thing seems to be just stir up a, sh a shit storm and it dazzles people and people are confused by it. And then he goes off and he doesn't give a shit and just does whatever he's going to do and people don't even notice. And it worked. It worked. So you have this person anyway, and she's sitting there like, oh, they're afraid of him and they don't care about us. So we should totally like push to get him back on Twitter. And I'm like, you motherfucking idiot. Like, no, like compare the Pied Piper was dumb. This is an order of magnitude stupider, just beyond misguided. Just like, what the fuck are you thinking? Anyway. And, and again, this is like, you know, what side are you on? Um, that's the only reason that that's an association for me. Similarly, also, like, um, in this fucking pandemic, um, people are just kind of tired of it and they're kind of done. And I do get it. I like, I'm, I'm not enjoying it. I'm not like, I, I, I don't love wearing a mask when I go places. But the thing is, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't matter. Like, it's still, it's the way it is. And just because you're done with something or you're bored with it doesn't mean, you can go out in a raging pandemic and just pretend that there's no, not a fucking raging pandemic going on. Um, it's, it's annoying. And there are so many people, ah, oh, I mean, like you got the fucking anti-vaxxers and you got the, the, the people who, even people that I know who got vaccinated, they got boosted, uh, they'd taken a lot of care and they're still like taking off the masks and just like, Fuck it. I'm just done with this shit. I'm done. Yeah. It's like, no, please don't do that. Please. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I get why you, I get why I definitely, I feel you, but not the best idea. Not the best fucking idea. Anyway, um, I'm updating my watch, so I don't have the time. So I have no idea how long I've been rambling on for. Usually I just keep looking at my watch the whole time. Um, I don't know if that's worse or better. I, but anyway, man, 
just kind of you know reset a second. Um, I don't know why, but I was just thinking about. Uh, I don't know if I should say her name or not, but the the Mike Two Hundred Six TA, and then um, my chemistry. The next semester, chemistry TA who um, went to banana slugs. You see, um, what is that? Santa Cruz. Remember her, and then kind of like um, it's just interesting when you think about it, like. And it'd be much more interesting in my head than what I'm projecting out because you're not hearing the, the thoughts, but it's just kind of, you know, you go through the moment and you're in, you know, you're in a certain state. You're in sort of like things similar to the song and especially like in the middle one where Joni was like really in the thralls of it, uh, you know, kind of like we're, uh, you... You're kind of if you if you've like a, a massive crush on somebody, you're kind of like it's very very strong and kind of like overwhelming in some ways, and partially good, and partially, I, I I wouldn't even say it's bad. I don't think I necessarily mind it or have minded it. I haven't really been in that position in a long time, but when it happened, you know, it was like um, I don't know how to describe it. Like and you know there there were sort of. A series, I guess, of those through my life. I mean, those two, very tiny one on uh, my, what even was that class? I don't know if it was geography or it was my freshman year of high school. And I was not, I, I was a little bit of a late bloomer. Like I wasn't really that into, you know, wasn't like that interested in relationships or sex or any of that kind of stuff until definitely like the end of high school and really more like beginning of undergrad. It kind of came online. Um, in fact, it's a weird thing. This is, I've probably talked about this before and uh, maybe this is just weird. I remember when I was like, uh, I don't know the grade, I pr probably about fifth grade, walking by a store and there's a mannequin and the mannequin had um, pretty sizable breasts and it was like a switch was flipped in my mind. It was like, before then, I, you know, I would notice them or something, but it wasn't a big deal. And now they were like, whoa. You know, like the, the switch flipped and it was just like a totally different experience. Same thing. Yeah. And in fact, the same thing happened in, um, I, I remember, <laughs> wow. Memory is so crazy. I can, I can put myself in there. I was in the um the life sciences e building at asu in one of the lecture halls it was actually the right one doesn't matter but it's the one that's closer to the stairs uh, and it's it's one of these nice lecture halls where it's kind of like tiered i would always sit in the back i was i was a pretty good student but i liked to be in the back and not be a i didn't want people behind me looking at me and b i liked to get the view of everything and not really like be up in the front i would just pay attention and then i'd get the fuck out of there when the class was done it was the beginning of class before, you know, well, before the class started. And I was back there and it must have been, um, I don't remember which class it was offhand. It must have been either my freshman or probably freshman year. I can't remember, but whatever it was, uh, there were these two women that walked down and it was again, like that light switch flipped. It must be some neural architecture thing that just, you know, like literally some circuit just turned on. And I just suddenly like noticed legs for the first time. And it was, it was such a weird, like it wasn't, it's not even, I don't know how to explain. Like if, if you, obviously if you're an adult and you're listening to this, you've probably had a similar experience. So maybe I don't need to explain it, but if you were a computer listening to this or you're an alien or whatever, I don't know how to explain it because it's not, it's not even like necessarily a, um, a sexual kind of thing. It's just like you see it and you're like enthralled with it. And it's, it, it's sort of like, it's not really like aesthetically beautiful. It's just like attractive in a way that you didn't have before. And then once that switch was flipped in both cases, it was just like a, a normal aspect from then on. 
but it was such a it's such a like remarkable almost black and white kind of thing like before this time did not you know just legs did not even factor in as a thing to me and then i'm in the class and i'm looking there and i'm like whoa you know, like oh wow that's really nice and uh, i mean that's kind of what it is it's like a, that's really nice thing and just like ever since then it's been there less so as i got as i've gotten older and those things have kind of it's not that they've like gone away but they're you know when it was like first there it's like really you know oh i can suddenly see a new color that i couldn't see before and then it kind of blends in like after a while you know you still notice it but it's not like overwhelming maybe this is kind of similar to um to crushes too although yeah i had um 206 ta chemistry ta and then um, i was working Wow, I was working in a um, in a a testing lab, like a medical testing lab, and there was someone there uh, from Hawaii who I just I don't know why, just really was pretty. Uh, I just enjoyed her company a lot and was really uh, pretty crushy. And wow, that was uh, that must have been my senior year of undergrad. It's, it's such a weird thing how you, know, you like put it into the context of your life. And then going forward, I'm in Hawaii. And my neighbor, who in, and I'm certainly not going to mention her name, but um, I've seen, you know, she has like four kids now or maybe more. And, you know, I was very into her at the time and probably bullet dodged let's just say and um or maybe not i don't know who knows but yeah interesting interesting thing and then kind of roll forward um i don't know there were it's kind of like a lull and my ex-wife she was into me i wasn't like hyper into her it was like a um i don't know was very driven by her and also my first real relationship um you know like i did I, I had relationships but you know like went on some dates but never really um uh, never really had sex never really got very far i don't know why i'm talking about this now but it's just like coming it, it, it actually i do know why it's because of the 206 ta it's just like uh, flooding to me um but you know was uh, sort of my first experience in fact with her and probably should have been like in the context of my life, you know, like looking back, probably should have been like a, a week or a couple of weeks long relationship and ended up being um, a relationship that brought me back to Arizona. I was living in Hawaii at the time. Um, she was in Oregon, came to Arizona. We both did PhDs there. And uh, then, you know, we're together two years, got married, got divorced two years later. And when we got divorced, man, it was, it was just so crazy. Like I, I would have, um, in retrospect, I'm very glad that we did. But at the time I would have just gone my whole life and stayed with her. And it was just going to be like, uh, I, w I was, I was fine with it. And I don't think it would have necessarily been, you know, like a bad life, but it's definitely, yeah in retrospect, not the best fit. And then you kind of go forward and you, you know, man, the year after she left, oh, after she, she finished her PhD in like stupidly fast time. I think it was like three or three and a half years. And when she finished her PhD, already like we were kind of, you could feel a lot of distance building and just not, not a ton of chemistry, not a ton happening. And then she finished her PhD and then she like went to Oregon for a month and um, just like, okay. Uh, before that, I guess she was like on the, uh, she was sleeping on the couch and uh, you know, I don't know, Skyping or talking to somebody or whatever. I, I, I suspect in retrospect, they kind of know who it was, uh, like high school boyfriend, because they ended up getting together later on. Uh, maybe they were talking, or, it doesn't really matter, but um, she goes to Oregon comes back and uh, like a month later 
and I apologize if this is too much information, but we had sex for the last time and it was like two o'clock in the morning or I don't even know when. And it was like so long from the previous time. I was like definitely down, uh, but I was also like so tired and this was before my insomnia. So it was a time where yeah, I was just, I normally would just sleep through the night and I was just not awake and I was barely, you know, it was just like probably the second worst experience I've had in my life just cause and not like painful or anything, but just like not, not really happening, not really into it. And it was kind of, kind of, I think mutual, but she was for some reason interested. And then, uh, I guess we went to a couple's therapist shortly after that. Maybe we, maybe we started a little bit earlier, but we, we did, you know, a little at ASU, they have like a therapy thing. They directed us to somebody outside, went to a session with her. And I think talking to my current therapist who is several therapists later, um, but my current, uh, the, the therapist that I talk to now, we were talking about this and she was saying like, you know, part of or like one of the reasons to do couples therapy isn't just to make the relationship work or try to figure out ways to make it work. But sometimes, you know, like one or both of the people actually like maybe the relationship is time to end. You go to the couples therapy and it's kind of like a way to figure that out. So in retrospect, I think that's kind of what happened, but that therapist, um, I saw her with my ex-wife and then my ex-wife was kind of like leaving or on the way out. And then I started seeing that therapist on my own. And that was the first time in my life where I would go to therapy and it was really productive. It was, it, it, I, I had gone, like I had really crippling social anxiety and you know, like I still have like traces of it in different areas, but probably not super obvious now, but when I was young, I mean, it was just so bad. And my senior year of high school, maybe even my, maybe it was before then, but about then started going and saw somebody and, uh, I don't know that was, we went, I, I saw him for like a year, this therapist and we talked, it was not bad. Um, he did get me my first job at Intel indirectly cause his neighbor was my first boss. And that was kind of how I launched into that. And I still know that guy today. I haven't seen him in a couple of years, but really good guy. And, uh, you yeah, know, kind of one of those people that sort of weaves in and out of your life. But that therapist um, is pretty much like worthless. And it's not his fault either. Like I was just not mentally in the right place. I wasn't really, you know, there, there's something about therapy. Like I think uh, having done a bit of it, you have to be in order for it to work you really have to be in the right place and the right mindset. I think it really helps to have the right person and the person doesn't necessarily like, it, it could be the right person at the right time. It doesn't have to be like this person's just the, like the right fit for you, period. It's like, uh, you know, you have that couples therapist for the process of just dealing with breaking up and getting divorced and all of that kind of stuff. She was really good. And then, after that was done, it was kind of like, yeah, we're kind of like, not like closing the book on therapy, but you know, like we're, we're kind of like at a place and just kind of move on. I, I could have kept going to her, but it was just not productive anymore. And so stopped. And then years later, um, the one that I'm currently seeing, I think there might've been one in between, but that the one that I'm currently seeing, um, I went to her for, because she does uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia and was trying to do something about my insomnia as, as I've done many times. Um, and there are some techniques that we worked on that helped a little bit, but ended up being more, um, a good fit just for general kind of like therapy. And now we're to a point where it's kind of like we were doing like once a week. Now it's like once a month kind of get together, sync, and just sort of see where things are, talk about interests and plans and thoughts and that kind of stuff. And kind of, yeah, I, I found it very useful. I think, um, yeah, I really recommend it actually, if you're in the position for it and if you have the resources for it, obviously it's expensive and you know, difficult, 
And also, I mean, like the right person, the right style, it really makes a big difference. And then being right, like in the right place mentally, like uh, if you're not going to do, if you're not going to act, it, you, you can, it's so easy to go to therapy and just, um, oh, I remember the one before that. Um, the other, th there were other therapists in my life that, the, 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 you know, like, um, Briefly saw a child one when I got there when my parents got divorced. Yeah, I think my mom was more worried about me than, um, yeah. But I was actually, like, honestly, when my parents got divorced, um, I kind of was happy when they got separated because I, first off, I got to see my dad more and hung out with him more. It was kind of a win there. My parents would argue and kind of had some friction. And now they were not really seeing each other and the friction part and the unpleasantry there was was gone so it was I found it like mostly a relief uh, but anyway uh, the other therapist that and this one was really this was probably the most impactful therapist in the shortest amount of time I saw him he was at ASU and he was actually in the um, they have they have a thing where they have like therapy for sort of like occupational therapy basically so it's like um, a lot of it is like people will have some kind of conflict at work or something and then they get sent there. Um, but they're also just a resource that's there. And I was having so much trouble just, I was frustrated in my job. I, and, and I was like, I, I felt, I, I really felt like the stuff that I, I was working hard, the stuff I was doing didn't get appreciated and didn't really, you know, and then the organization that I was in ended up having somebody who I kind of brought in to, you know, facilitate it from the outside. Somehow he kind of finagled his way into taking over and God, he was, yeah, I mean, just such a, I, I don't want to call him a piece of shit, but I mean, he just, and he got paid like 250 grand to run this thing. And he just sat there and like, fucked. I, I mean, like literally, it was annoying. It was depressing. Because it's like, yeah, I could do this fucking job a thousand times better than this guy. And I, in, in retrospect, also, like, getting divorced, probably better than I didn't get it. But I could have done a much better job. He's just kind of sitting there, like, fucking off and not really, you know, just wasting time. And um, basically, like, letting the thing fall apart. It was really just sad and annoying. I had a bunch of stuff teed up, like, grant proposals and things to... And he just kind of let them all fall to the wayside and let the thing just fall apart. And then eventually he kind of got kicked out. But the therapist that I saw there, because I was so frustrated, the very first session that we had, uh, we're talking about it and I don't remember what we said exactly, but basically his insight, which, you know, from what I said about my situation and all of this kind of stuff, it made me feel so much better and it made everything kind of come into focus for that moment at least and that decision. It wasn't, I, I didn't even know it was a decision. It was like, I'm just in this position where I can't stand it. Um, and I, I'm talking to him and then he's like, well, here's the thing that I think. You are very values driven and you have a lot of, um, you know, kind of like strong moral and ethical code, which I guess, I guess I do. And I think I actually feel pretty good about that, but I, you know, it's, it's an aspect of me and you feel like this is wrong where you are and the fact that also like at some point there I went from really busting my ass to like feeling like things didn't matter to kind of almost trying to get fired I mean I wasn't trying to get fired but just kind of like let the slack I talked about this at the beginning you can let the slack go on your job and it takes a long fucking time for somebody to say something to you it took like six months there and it was um it was a while but anyway um uh, talking to the guy and he's like, you know, this is the thing you have to do. This, I mean, this, this was his, his advice. And I think, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever had. And I always tell people since here, uh, he basically said, you know, like, don't just quit in a huff and, uh, you know, wind things down, get to the point where you can actually be in a good position and go to something else, but you should be on the way out. Right. And that, at that moment, I just, I was like, first off, holy shit, obviously, yeah. And it all made sense and it all felt right. And I had this unburdening, like, relief. 
just like, oh my God, this is so, yeah. And, and so anyway, um, you know, he's, or we, we talked, we, we talked again for a few sessions, mostly just kind of like about the logistics, but nothing really substantive. It was just that one that was like, oh shit, that was so worth it. I'm so fucking glad that I came to this thing. Um, and anyway, went there, uh, had a meeting with the shithead that was my boss and basically said, you know, like, eh, I'm gonna, I'd like to wind this down. I'd like to, you know, get out of here in, um, you know, like December-ish and then blah, 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 and kind of worked on stuff. Uh, wound some stuff down, got there and then got out. And it was, it was not easy being kind of on my own already. And, um, you know, it, it's so much better, honestly, like having somebody else worry about paying you and especially also like, you know, working in a place like ASU or Intel where you've got the salary coming in, um, and it's not a situation where you're like, oh, we might not get paid this month or this, this cycle, you know, and that's a thing that I've known way too much since then. Um, but it's so much, it was, it was just such a fucking relief to be out of there. It's different now because that guy is, well, he's still a professor and he's still making a stupid amount of money and it's fucking offensive to me. Um, and, and then actually, so he was one of the, um, I don't know how much to talk. This is something I probably shouldn't even bring up or maybe it's not a big deal. I've, I've brought up a lot of other stuff here. So, um, in terms of like crushes through my life, if you want to call them that, um, the, the biggest and strongest one was when I was kind of end of grad school and into that job. And there was someone who was, um, she was getting her PhD in, uh, in astronomy, astrophysics. And I don't know what it was about her. Um, it was something like, uh, I don't know. I, I remember, it's kind of weird. The first time I met her was at Four Peaks and I would get iced tea and I just, uh, I would, I would just have like a shit ton of iced tea and I loved to have like the lemons and the sugar and you know just kind of, and I think I just didn't have sugar and I was waiting for the waitress and she, you know, after I just met her and you know, she was kind of like, uh, um, decently attractive, maybe not like the physically most attractive person the, that you've seen, but there's something kind of about her personality and the thing there that just kind of like stuck, stuck with me. Uh, she went over and just decided like physically got up, got the sugar, came back and it's like, oh, that was really nice. And that didn't really, uh, it wasn't like, oh, I'm you know, in love with this person here, but it was, you know, it, it made an impression, you know? And she was heading actually, th this was like right before she was going to go to India soon. And, uh, yeah, met her and then kind of like, uh, didn't see her again for a number of months. And then, um, <clears throat> I guess I was in my, my office and I'm sitting there and then, um, I'm sitting in my like little cube at the time. And, uh, then I look over and like, oh, Jesus, like she's, she's just standing like here and we just talked and, um, really enjoy, like, I don't know, there's in my life, I've not had somebody, I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm somebody who is very, even of the, the sort of crushes that I've talked about, uh, I'm pretty even keeled, you know, I'm pretty, um, almost to a fault, like overly stable emotionally. And something about her just like, you know, I don't know, I just, um, it, it still, I mean, it's been, I, I think the last time we talked was like a decade ago, maybe even more. And it was not a pleasant conversation. Um, in fact, what was it? 2000, it must be 2013, 2014. Uh, it was like a text exchange. And it was not, not great at all. It was basically like, you know, I'm getting married. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Um, adios. And I said, um, yeah, like congrats. And, um, yeah, I hope things go well for you. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, still as bad as that ended, um, 
just thinking about her, still kind of like, it's, it's weird. It's both a very unpleasant thing and it's also, um, you know, I have some emotional charge to it, which is just fucking weird, especially me being me. Uh, but anyway, you know, she's standing there and then we talked for a while and, um, you know, she's explaining, oh, there are these mic er, microscopes, telescopes on the top of this building and, um, you know, we should go up someday and do, do, you know, like look at some stars or some other stuff. I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Ended up basically not happening, but, uh, yeah. And then I'm at home on Friday night and I don't know what I was working on. I was doing something. And this was back when there was G talk, Google talk, and that like chatting thing. And she just pops up and is like, uh, Mew, M-E-W, like meow, I guess is the, and it's like, hello? And you know, she's like, oh, that's uh, her, her name. And then, uh, oh, how did you get my information? This mutual friend gave it to her. And we talked uh, that day, I mean, just like, one of the longer conversations I've ever had with anyone, um, especially like out of the blue, just kept going back and forth. And then from there, we're talking for a while and it just like felt, um, I don't know, it's just not, it's hard to explain exactly, but just, you know, I, I would, uh, if I got to see her for like five minutes to have coffee or something, or just, you know, like have a little chat or, you know, we talked for hours, it just made me feel awesome. You know, like, uh, even like, it's depressing. Like even uh, at times when she was kind of shitty to me, um, just, you know, felt good to see her. And it was, uh, man, I, I, I don't even know. I don't know like the, the course of that. Like, this, this is a thing I, I could, I could unpack it for a long time. I'm going to, I don't want to just like leave it hanging. So I'm going to spend like five minutes, but I could spend hours talking about this. Uh, I probably won't, but yeah, five minutes for now. Um, we were talking and talking, and then we went to a party at uh, another friend's house or apartment at the time. He was a grad student too. I actually weirdly just saw him uh, a couple weeks ago. He, <laughs> you haven't seen him in uh, like probably a decade. Uh, he's been in uh, the UK and he's coming back to the US now. But anyway, um, we were at his place. Uh, she drove me there and then drove me back and you know at the end of the thing and i don't know why i and in re in retrospect probably not the best or wisest idea but i wrote her kind of like a an email saying you know kind of how i felt really liked her and you know i understand like the situation is yeah maybe you're not interested in all of this but i just kind of wanted to put this out here and um yeah i sent it that night and then um Wow. The, when I finally heard back from her the next day, it was like, well, you know, I know you're probably waiting for, for this and, um, eh, basically not interested. Um, and I think we should probably get some distance for a while. And, you know, so it didn't, um, uh, really kind of sucked. It was one of, it's sort of weird. Like I'm again, like factor her out. And I'm pretty fucking even keeled. And, you know, like with her, like the highs are so much higher and the lows so much lower. Um, you know, so anyway, didn't talk to her for like six months, maybe even a year. I don't even know. And then we started hanging out again and started talking again. Um, yeah, and it was like, uh, a, it was kind of a, I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. I suspect there was probably stuff going on outside of the picture that I could see, but whatever it was, from my perspective, it was kind of like very, yeah, we, and, and to be clear, she was never, or she never expressed any romantic interest in me or, you know, anything like that. Um, and I, 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 I would say that I didn't do anything like over the line. I certainly, um, like the only time I ever like even physically touched her, she was, we were out climbing out um and uh she fell down and so our friend you know i i like walked her um carried her you know 
like this way and then our other friend was carrying our other shoulder yeah that was like the only time at all that i had any kind of physical contact with her probably so you know um not really like a i, I would say pretty you know and, and anyway um i'm kind of just like uh like my face is almost the you know i'm, I'm really Yeah, kind of thrown off by this just thinking about it but it's just uh, such a weird experience and uh, yeah so so frustrating like in it probably like even if she was ever interested it probably like maybe it wouldn't have ended or would have ended badly I don't know maybe it would have just not um, although honestly like I the weird thing is it wasn't even necessarily like um I mean, it, there's an element of romantic interest there, but it's also just like, this is a person that I just, you know, whatever the capacity, um, just wanted to spend time with. Although it, definitely there was a romantic side to it because it was, uh, you know, frustrating when she would be like dating somebody else. And often the people that she'd be dating would be like, the, the one that she married, I think of the people that I met that she was dating was probably like the best. But some of the people she dated, I mean, it was just like, and this was not just, this is not honestly just jealousy speaking. It was like, uh, just fucking slow or assholes or, you know, much younger, um, which I, I understand younger has a thing, but you know, it was like, um, you'd see that and you'd be like, how, cause she's pretty, she's pretty smart. And you know, like, how do you, how can you stand hanging out with this person? Like, uh, the, the one that I remember, who I think was the one that she dated before the guy she ended up marrying, um, this guy, like, oh my God. Uh, he, he, I guess, I, I learned this later on, but he kind of, like, ran through a lot of the, um, the women who were grad students, you know, like, dated them for a while. And he was just, you know, I mean, from my perspective, and granted, I, I, I'm not a good judge of dudes, did not seem particularly attractive. Uh, like, I don't understand. And that's, you know, there are dudes who I will look at and I'll be like, I understand why someone would find that guy attractive. This guy you'd look at and you're like, eh. And, um, yeah, just so, like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be, like, overly, like, picking on the guy, but he was so fucking dumb. Like, just, like, you listen to him and you just you could just see that things were not connecting and i don't know if he was a grad student i don't know what his fucking thing was but he just did not was not that bright and then he like the thing that one of the things that we one of the few times that i talked to him and actually this was um there was a probe or something that was crashing into the moon and uh we were up actually went up on that um uh, physical sciences F building, looked at the scopes there. It was the one time that ever happened. Uh, but, you know, awesomely enough with uh, her dating that dude and it was there. And yeah, like he told me some joke. I don't remember what the joke was. I do remember, I mean, to call it a joke, obviously it was intended to be funny, but it was so dumb and I didn't laugh. And I wasn't trying to be an asshole. I just like didn't, it was just not funny. And then when I didn't laugh, he told me the same joke again and kind of like hit it a little to, you know, like, cause to him, this was apparently, it was just like, I don't know. It was, you sat there and it, it was one of these moments in life where you're almost taken aback by like, how is this really happening? Like, are you, are you okay? Like maybe he was on drugs. I don't know. Maybe something was, maybe he had some kind of like traumatic brain injury or whatever. I don't know, but not the, not the most impressive guy. And, uh, you know, it was just like, I, I don't know how you could stand to be with this person. And then I guess at some point they broke up and there, there was an interesting thing. I'm not on Facebook. I haven't been on Facebook in, um, forever really like several years at least but when i was on facebook there were people who i would occasionally become friends with and then disconnect from 
uh, like Facebook friends, whatever that's for. She and I were Facebook friends and then not, and then Facebook friends and then not, probably like three or four times. It was such a weird, such a weird thing. I mean, it, like in my life, I mean, frustrating, kind of in a weird way, wonderful too, and the good parts, but also just like, uh, so like, uh, man, I mean, uh, we, I, 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 you know, I've explained kind of like, I, I just, the act of seeing or speaking with her, uh, spending any time with her at all just made me feel awesome. And then, um, uh, yeah, we were going climbing like once or twice a week. Um, she and I and a group of people. And I don't even know what happened, but at some point, something happened. And it was kind of, I mean, it was, it was just like this, I, like, I, 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 what, what the fuck happened here? But all of a sudden, you know, she had collected a bunch of people that were climbing with her and with us at the moment. And then all of a sudden it was like, uh, I was persona non grata. Like, uh, it, 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 one of the more crushing feelings in my life, honestly, like probably too, you know, on the order of as bad as it was, um, when I got divorced, actually, not that, you know, again, we had never, no, no relationship other than kind of like, uh, a friendship, but she just like would not talk to me, would not engage with me at all. It was like, I, I, I've never had this experience in my life where you're like at a place and the person is there that you know, and even not, even if it's somebody you don't want to talk to, it's like somebody that you like at least acknowledge and you know, and then it was like, um, just I wasn't there. I was like, what, what the fuck is going on here? Um, and me being me, I felt like I did some horrible thing because it was like, I don't know what the fuck I did, but I feel like, you know, I must have done. Because I, I mean, it, I, I just am thinking like, what kind of infraction would I have, would someone have to commit for me to do this to them? And it wasn't just her. It was like a lot of people in the group. There was one guy um, who was kind of nice to me. And then there were a couple people who were kind of like, eh, okay. But it was like the whole fucking group just sort of like shunned me and I would like climbing is one of it, it, it was two horrible blows because spending time with her was awesome it was one of the things I enjoyed most of that period of my life and climbing was one of my favorite things to do and climb one of the things that I like about climbing is it would be like and it doesn't as long as it's somebody who's good and who you have kind of a rapport with uh, so certainly anyone in this group um uh, you'd climb and then you'd belay and you'd kind of talk and you'd, you'd be on the wall. And while you're on the wall, you're sort of very focused. You could talk a little bit, but you're basically like a little almost meditative thing, you know, just paying attention to what you're doing. And then you come down and then you bullshit a little bit and then they go up. And I, I loved that. That was one of the best things, probably at the moment in my life, uh, the best thing that I had going. And all of a sudden it was like the people, I, I went from this big group of people where I could always climb with somebody to all of a sudden, like they're, the, it was actually worse than just to go like, oh, I, I don't know anyone here. Cause I was there and these people who I know are sitting there and just like, I don't exist. Like I can't climb with anyone. And I, I'm sure that like, I knew the people who worked there and they would have connected me with some random person. Um, but climbing with a random person that you don't know, I've had, I've done it many times and sometimes it's okay. And sometimes they're not paying attention or they don't know how to belay or, you know, they're slow or whatever. And, uh, you know, you're like climbing and then all of a sudden you realize, oh shit, they haven't pulled in like three or four moves. And if I fall now, I'm going to fall quite a bit and I might even hit the ground and I'm going to get hurt. It's like, could you please pull the fucking rope? Um, but yeah, it, so it went from, this thing that I enjoyed so much with somebody who I enjoyed spending time with so much to all of a sudden, like, um, I would go and I ended up having to boulder, which I find miserable anyway. It's probably good for you. Cause you're like bouldering. You're just kind of climbing on your own. And 
each move you can kind of practice a bunch of times and it's sort of the most difficult move of a normal route is the bouldering route just over and over again the most difficult kind of tier move but i just i i, I can't stand it i i do not like i'll do it if i have to but it's just not fun for me it whatever it is that i like about top roping and lead climbing it's just not there and even if i'm in there with somebody and talking to somebody but especially when you're there on your own and you're just kind of it's just like this is adjacent to this thing that i love and yet um so far from it that it's like a horrible mutated version of it um and, and eventually i did start like getting another partner and you know i could climb regularly again but it was for like a period of a couple months probably I, I don't know exactly how long but you know like these people are there i can't climb with anyone and it was just like crushing like just crushing in in a way that i can't even um uh, yeah it was one of the most fucked up things that I've had um, in my, like, really in terms of, like, social stuff in my life. Uh, maybe that means that I've had a, like, really lucky life, but it was just so unpleasant. And so, like, what the fuck is going on here? Um, but anyway, man, it's, it's weird how much, kind of, I'm not bitter about that part, but I, I am, like, you know, like, what? Why did, and the thing, I feel bad now for feeling bad at the time, because, like, at the time I was, like, obviously I must have done something horrible. Like, they, I mean, what the, I don't know what it is, but I must have done something, like, unforgivable to, to be treated this way. And now I'm looking back and I'm like, I don't think so. I, whatever, whatever happened here, I don't even know if I had a part in it, to be honest. And, you know, I'm looking back and I'm actually kind of annoyed with, like, Whatever the fuck happened is like, yeah, what, I don't know, it irritates me. It, I feel, I still feel like bad about it and, you know, but I'm, I'm like a little bit bitter, honestly, about it because it was, yeah, and this was a long fucking time ago. This is more than a decade ago. Not a big deal. Um, well past it. But it's also like, um, I've, I've never... In my life had somebody treat me that shittily i've never i don't think i've ever treated somebody that shittily maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong but i don't think i have i don't think i would and you know you just look at that and it's also like it's coming from someone like i feel like she was kind of the ringleader of the group so or like the queen bee from the sort of high school clique sort of thing so i feel like it was coming from her whatever it was um, and it's just like, it's, it's crushing. Cause it's like this person that you like so much, um, is now, not only are they not talking to you, but now you've got a whole group of people who you could have climbed with before and enjoyed spending time with. And then like on Thursdays, we'd go to four peaks and just kind of hang out, go from that to like, yeah, they're there, they're doing it. Um, they're going to four peaks afterwards, but you can't come. And it's like, what, what, the, why? The, I mean, I feel like, um, feel like a little child, like sitting there, like crying almost like, what, what, what did I do? Like, what the fuck? What the fuck? Um, man, that was like, it's kind of like such a, in a weird way, like tumultuous period of my life. And, um, you know, probably in my life, I've not had highs or lows. I, I, and I mean, like, literally, the the events that come anywhere near that magnitude are, like, my dad died um, and getting divorced. Those are probably, like, the most traumatic things that happened in my life. And this one is right up there. It's, like, yeah, I'm not saying it's, like, more. It's not like it was worse than my dad dying, but it was, like, approaching that level of, you know, yeah. And then, you know, man, I just like, uh, such, what a, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just frustrating. Cause it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's like, ah, just can't even, I can't even articulate uh, what I'm thinking of there or, you know, and I don't, I, I feel like there's a missing, part of it also is like the way that my brain works 
when there's kind of a puzzle to be solved or like something doesn't fit, it it bothers me. It's not just that it bothers me, but I like have this almost compulsion to understand like what happened and get a complete picture. And I don't have that. I feel like there's something that's missing there. And it's just, in addition to the, the misery and difficulty and just pain from that, it's also like this, um, you know, like I, I, I just feel like something, there's something that I, like, I want to know what the fuck, what the fuck, like what the fuck, um, did it, maybe I did something, maybe I committed some horrible offense, um, uh, maybe somebody else said something or maybe like, I, I don't know what it was, whatever it was, I'd like to fucking know. You know, I'd kind of, I, I guess at this point, like, again, you know, it's been a decade or more. It doesn't really matter. Um, I should be kind of like, yeah, if I, if I live the rest of my life and I never know, it's not like I'm going to be at a massive loss for it, but it's still, to this day, it's still a little bit annoying to me that I don't know and frustrating. And at the time, especially like it was just, yeah, at the time it was the middle, um, the middle both sides song where you're like really kind of like um, miserable about stuff. And yeah, it, it's such a weird thing to be like in, in that position where it was like, there's somebody, because it, it, it was these two things. I probably have said this several times, so this will be my last one. But yeah, there's the person that you really like, love spending time with, and just like the best part of my, of, of that part of my life was the moments where we would hang out or chat or whatever. And she's there, but you can't, you can't, not only can't you spend time with her, you know, even like having a very casual conversation, like, Hey, how's it going? Was not, uh, you know, it was not in the cards. Like I tried it a couple of times and it was, it was like, literally, if you started it, if you started screaming at a random stranger, they would probably be less like um, off than than this. Uh, like I, I, you know, it was just such a fucking weird, you know, like mind fuck kind of thing. And you know, it's this person that you really want to hang out with, and also, you know, and, and I, I'm not trying to diminish this for, first one, but was this massive thing there and also the climbing and it was a massive thing there. And it was also like the climbing part of the climbing is tied up in like social stuff. So completely independent of her, like there was this group of people I could climb with and there other than like one dude who I still to this day really appreciate the fact that he wasn't like a complete dick to me here. Um, although, you know, Never, I mean, we never talked about whatever the fuck was going on, but never told me either. But um, of that group, like he was the only dude who would kind of like treat me like a human being or like I was there, like not even like a human being. It was like, not, it was not even like people were treating you like scum. It was like, they're just not, even, you're not even there. You're not, you, you don't exist. You're just a fucking ghost. <laughs> And, and you're, I, I, I wish that I could explain what that's like. Um, I don't, I don't wish that upon anyone because it is not a pleasant thing, but you're like in a place with people, you know, and if you try to have a conversation with them, if you try to say, Hey, you want to go climbing? You, you, you know, we're all here. Do you want to partner up? We can just, and it's not even like a no. It's not like an acknowledgement. It's like, you don't fucking exist. Um, it's like, um, man, I haven't thought about that in a long time, but that was such a fucked up, thing. <laughs> like such a fucked up thing. I've never, I, the, the closest I can imagine is like in probably teenage girls and they're shitty to somebody and they have the, the whole like queen bee syndrome where it's like, you know, we're just going to shun, you know, so we're going to shun Sally. Like Sally just doesn't exist. And I mean, you know, I was Sally there, but anyway, it just, um, yeah, man, it just like annoys the shit out of me to think about. And it's frustrating too. Cause it's like, um, I don't know. Um, uh, that, that, well, anyway, 
I think that's enough for now, but uh, just blah, blah, blah. Need to, yeah, blah. I, 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 ah, just such a fucked up thing. I, I, I'm like taken aback by how fucked up the situation was. And I still like, don't know what happened there. And it bugs me in, in such a way. The only thing, like the, um, the only thing that I can kind of think about was a few years before this, I will do this really quickly, but a few years before this, I was on a forum and in this forum, there are a bunch of people that I know and we're friendly with and a similar thing happened. Like everybody started just cold shouldering me, um, in this forum. It was a love line forum because we were a bunch of fans of love line before we realized that Adam and Drew were like complete, you know, assholes. Um, but at the time I didn't know, I, I enjoyed especially listening to Adam and now like he's just a massive piece of shit. And yeah, you know, like, but we were all in this forum, like talking and friendly and all of this and people start giving me this weird fucking shit. Um, I mean, I, I, again, it was not giving me shit. It was that same kind of feeling like the, the only other time in my life that I've had, I mean, in person, this climbing thing was the only time that I've had that, that I remember, but this was the same kind of thing in an electronic form. And like, everybody's acting super weird with you and then all this. And then like a month or a month and a half after that happened, after it started, um, this one person on the forum, uh, was like accusing me of sending something to her and her boyfriend that, um, I don't even remember what it was, but the evidence for for this, and this is one of these things, it was kind of funny actually. The evidence was they had something that somebody put in a, a return address that was from some address in some town in Arizona that I've never heard of. And not only that, a weird thing was it was not postmarked. Like she put pictures of this thing up and they're in like New York or Connecticut or someplace in the, in the Northeast. Um, no fucking, you know, no postmark. Uh, so this thing was supposed to be in their mail, probably with no postmark didn't come. And the evidence that it was me was that it was from, you know, somebody wrote a return address that was some city in Arizona, like something about church something, or I don't even know what, but whatever it was, it was a city I've never heard of, probably nowhere near where I am. And again, like the return address, not a postmark. And she was telling people in the background that I was doing this weird thing. I don't even know what it was that she was thinking that, you know, like sending like weird threatening things or, or the, whatever the fuck. And then as soon as that came out, it was like, you know, I mean, first off, no, I did not do that. Second, there's no fucking postmark. If I sent you something, there would be a postmark. Um, and then it just kind of fell apart as soon as, you know, as soon as it came into daylight and people still were, I mean, it went from people were, sort of shunning me to, you could kind of feel like, uh, oh, now I feel like shit because I was shunning somebody for no reason. And so I feel a little awkward. And now years later, I'm still friends with some of those people. So it did recover, but it was like for a little while, it was just so, again, so fucking weird. And it was the same, it's the same kind of feeling like whatever, whatever was going on here, uh, felt very much like that. And maybe they're totally different cases, but that's like in my mind, the association I always make. And in both cases, it's such a, I mean, humans are such social creatures. And when you're, especially you're in a place like in that forum, it was like my, it was my biggest social life for a little while it was like hanging out with these people there. And similarly, the climbing was my biggest social thing for a while, a different time in my life. And in both of those cases, you know, like the people that you're, they're like your social circle, just stop associating with you or talking to you. Um, it's, or, or acknowledging that you exist. It's not a good feeling. It's not a, it's, you know, it's like really fucked up. So with that, um, I, I don't have a, a conclusion on that one. Um, anyway, and it's like, but I'm curious how long this one was. Feels like it was like three hours long. I hope it wasn't, but uh, we'll see.
Um, and I hope also it's not too late because I would like to go for a walk before I go to bed. And um, I started this a little bit late, but not late enough. Like if this is just an hour, I have time. If it was like multiple hours, then not so much. Uh, but I feel like this was a good therapy session. Yeah, so anyway, um, with that. Uh, just, yeah. I feel, I, I actually feel like I've had kind of an emotional experience here for the, and again, like I'm, I'm somebody mostly, mostly in life, and uh, I'm not a really emotional person. I'm not, it's not that I don't have emotions. It's just that my emotions, you know, my highs and my lows are pretty muted. And even when like, you know, you go back to, um, yeah, I try, I try to think like the most traumatic kind of thing in my life, uh, like my dad dying was definitely very bad. And then I kind of reset to, you know, not like instantly back to normal, but pretty quickly kind of back to my set point. Uh, getting divorced, that one, it took like a year to get, you know, more or less normal, but pretty quickly back to normal. Um, and other than that kind of stuff, like I'm generally, you know, and with this one person, um, you know, who I did it again, I don't like, it's weird because it feels like there's missing context that just doesn't make everything make sense. But with her, I felt, um, you know, like the highest highs that I've had in my life were just like time spent with her. And then the lowest lows were just like, you know, the frustration of um, not being able to spend time with her or um, the the whole fucking climbing thing. Um, and it wasn't just climbing. It was like, you know, like total, you know, social cutoff. Uh, whatever that was, and the periods where, you know, like we would reconnect, um, yeah, it, it, we would go for a long period without talking, and then all of a sudden, it was like, you know, hey, how's it going? Why don't you come to my office for coffee? Or why don't you, um, why don't you come to my birthday party? And then we spent, like, hours talking at her birthday party. And, yeah, and then it was like, things are normal and awesome again for a little while, and then it was just such a, like, a, kind of a roller coaster, I guess, in a weird way. Um, and also, like, uh, I don't know. But anyway, whatever it was, um, just bugs me. Um, but it's, it's definitely an emotionally charged thing, because that's, like, I feel, yeah. I have a lot of feelings going on right now, just thinking about uh, the climbing thing. Um, some positive feelings thinking about her still, and then some really negative feelings, kind of, because I kind of feel like, um, I don't know, I mean, I'm not saying, no, yeah, I, I guess I would kind of say, like, in my life, I probably never enjoyed somebody's company as much, and I've never been treated as shittily as this person and it's the same person and it kind of fucks with you and now granted maybe that i mean that was like you know a long time ago and hopefully um uh, hopefully she's gone on to have a a life that's not a lot of that kind of stuff i know yeah she was definitely like a person that would i wouldn't say like necessarily would fuck with people but and i don't mean obviously like sexually fuck with but i mean you know like I, I definitely knew other people who, I would say she emotionally kind of like um, screwed with them a little bit. She had like a, um, I, I, I don't even want to spend like another half hour talking about it, but uh, she, there was someone who I ended up being pretty good friends with for a while. And the two of them, um, she was also, I think like a, um, I don't know if she was astrophysics or earth or geology or whatever, but geo geology and astrolo astrology, Jesus, astronomy and astrophysics were all kind of in the uh, school of earth and space exploration. I think she was earth side of that, but they had like a, um, a wedding and not like an actual wedding, but like a, you know, ceremony kind of thing. And then she ended up being, she being the, the one that I also liked, 
uh, at various other times. Um, yeah, ended up like cutting that off or doing something. I, I didn't even know what the fuck the story was there, to be honest. Um, and I wasn't invited to that because that was in one of the off times. Um, and then it eventually like was not a, a thing, but you know, you, like you saw it on Facebook. I talked to the other one. We didn't talk too much about that particular thing, but it was like definitely, um, yeah, she, she, she would monkey with people. Like I do think uh, like toy with people a little bit and kind of, yeah. And I'm not sure that that's what happened there, but whatever it was, again, it's like, ah, frustrating. With that, now I'm actually going to say, Saichan.